off this countdown, we have the Growler Bear. The Growler Bear, or the Pizzly Bear, is a cross between a Polar Bear and a Brown Grizzly Bear. This actually happened naturally in the wild, which is kind of hard to believe. Basically, because of climate change destroying the bear's habitats, they started breeding with each other out of desperation, which is actually pretty sad. It's believed that the first Growler Bear was discovered in 2006. On April 16th, 2006, a hunter named Jim Martell was out hunting when he captured a growler bear. At first, he thought it was just a polar bear, but officials took a look at it and noticed it had strange features. Later, it was determined to be a growler bear or pizzly bear. It's really funny. To, it's really funny to say. In our ninth spot, we have a zorse. Any guesses as to what this animal is mixed with? Well, it's a mix between a zebra and a horse or sometimes a donkey too. Other people refer to them as zebula, or zebrul, or a zebra mule. These animals were created after crossbreeding a male zebra with a female horse. The offspring look more like a horse than a zebra, but they still got the identifying stripes. The first zorse was created during the 19th century by Charles Darwin. Now they are still around to this day, but they are extremely rare. This is because zorses are infertile or sterile. They can't reproduce on their own. So the only way to get more of these bad boys is to get someone to crossbreed them themselves. Moving on to number eight, we have the Jag Lion or Jag Leon, I don't know. It's a kind of a weird name, not gonna lie, but this animal is a cross between a jaguar and a lion. And these are actually naturally born. The first Jag Lion was unintentionally bred. It happened when a lion and a jaguar coexisted in the same zoo together. They were raised together and you know, one thing led to another and boom, baby jag lion. Not gonna lie, these things are beautifully terrifying. They are so unique and cool looking, but also I would never wanna come face to face with one. Now, let me share with you a quick little love story between a jaguar named Diablo and a lion named Lola. The two were raised side by side and were inseparable. When Lola got mature, they kept Diablo away from her so that they would never mate. But whenever they were apart, both animals would grow depressed. It got so bad to the point where Lola wouldn't even eat. So they brought them back together and bada bing bada boom, they had two babies together. So cute. Moving on to number seven, we have the human Z. It is so weird and uncomfortable putting this one on the list. But a human Z is a cross between a human and a chimpanzee. Yeah, I already know what you're thinking, but no, not that. Let me explain. Serious attempts have been made throughout the years to cross a chimp with a human. Since we're so similar in a genetic way, people believe that it's possible to do this. Ilya Ivanish Ivanov was the first person to attempt to create a human-chimp hybrid. I believe he started in 1918 and continued these experiences throughout the 1920s. During that time, the Soviet Union was also doing the same experiments. In 2019, rumor has it that a team of researchers from the Salk Institute from Biological Studies in the US successfully completed this. It's kind of creepy, I know. In our sixth spot, we have the Iron Age Pig. This is a big, mean old pig, literally. So the Iron Age Pig is a cross between a domestic pig and a wild boar. That's just like so wrong to me on so many levels. Like, poor little Miss Piggy. Now, look at this thing. It's huge and looks tough and mean. In fact, they are considered very hostile animals. It's because wild boars are typically more aggressive. That's one of the traits that gets passed along to their offsprings. Now they get their name because this pig has many characteristics of domesticated animals from the Iron Age period. Hello, there you go, Iron Age pig. It's quite fascinating. These pigs are generally bred in Europe for the sole purpose of selling and eating them. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the green sea slug. As strange as this one is, it's actually really interesting. Honestly though, this has to be the weirdest hybrid on this list. And that's because it's part animal and part plant. Yeah, it's a mix between a sea slug and algae. Yeah, yeah, algae. This sea slug was going around eating algae and eventually the algae became part of its DNA. It's very strange. Soon green sea slugs were born and contained chlorophyll, just like a plant. In fact, this is the first animal able to make chlorophyll like a plant. They literally can turn solar energy into food. 
Again, it's quite weird, but also fascinating. In our fourth spot, we have the Wolfin, which is really fun and funny to say. So a Wolfin is a mix between an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin and a false killer whale. In fact, these are considered very, very rare. The first recorded Wolfin was born in 1981 in Tokyo SeaWorld, but sadly, he passed away after 200 days. Now, the first Wolfin born in the US was at Sea Life Park in Hawaii in 1985, but she had trouble reproducing. Her baby Wolfins sadly passed away. Some say they have seen Wolfins out in the wild, but these sightings have never been confirmed. But if you do see one, it's very rare. Coming in at number three, we have the Enviro Pig. Okay, this one, I take it back. This one is probably the weirdest one on this list. Basically, an Enviro Pig is an environmentally friendly pig. Basically, pig's excrements are high in phosphorus. This phosphorus then ends up in lakes and rivers and oceans and can cause a boom of algae. So scientists were like, hey, let's just breed a pig with less toxic waste. And that's what they did. Enviro pigs are pigs with up to 65% less phosphorus in their excrements. This pig was first created in 1999 at the University of Guelph's farm in Canada. This pig had its phytase gene attached to a piece of mouse DNA. Basically, in the end, it made the pig produce an enzyme to help it better digest plant phosphorus, which is a nutrient in its feed. Voila, from there, Enviro pigs were born. In our second spot, we have the Belgian super cow. Now, when they said super cow, they weren't joking, because take a load of this cow. It's monstrous. As many of you guys know, cows are my favorite animal, but this one terrifies me. It's massive, like look at its muscles. I'm sorry, but no animal should be as ripped as that. So basically this super cow was created back in the 1800s when Belgian scientists and farmers mixed native cattle with shorthorn cattle. Then over the time they would select the biggest and strongest offsprings of each variety and get them to breed together. So on and so on, bam, you got this super cow, which is definitely the biggest and strongest. So maybe let's stop doing that because this cow is soon gonna get too big for its own good and like take over the world or something. And in our number one spot, we have the human pig hybrid. Yes, this is a real thing. Scientists at the Salk Institute for Biological Sciences in California have created a human pig hybrid. Now you're probably wondering why on earth would they do this? Well, they did this in hopes that one day they could grow human organs inside of pigs and other animals instead of waiting for a donor. So in 2017, an embryo was placed in an adult pig for four weeks. Then this was taken out and analyzed and the embryo survived and contained some human cells. Now they're going to figure out if pig embryos can handle enough human cells to create human organs. It's very creepy in my opinion. Starting off this countdown, we have the wall fin. Take a guess at what two animals were bred for this one. If you guessed a whale and a dolphin, you're correct. A wall fin is a mix between an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin and a false killer whale. The first recorded wolfin was born in 1981 in Tokyo SeaWorld, but sadly he only lived to around six months. Probably a prime example of why they shouldn't exist in the first place. Another wolfin was later born at a sea life park in Hawaii in 1985, but she had trouble reproducing and all her babies sadly passed away. In our ninth spot today, we have the horse human. And this one is going to ruin your day completely. In 2001, a man was caught trying to inject human sperm into a horse. He had done this to about six horses until he was caught by police and arrested. Thankfully, none of the horses got pregnant. But ew, imagine if they did, woo. In our eighth spot, we have the Iron Age pig. Now take a look at this porker, he is a chunky guy. The Iron Age pig is a cross between a domestic pig and a wild boar. Now something about that cross just does not sit right with me. Now people like breeding these pigs because they can get a lot of meat out of them or just sell them for a lot. But they are considered very hostile animals. This is due to the fact that wild boars are typically more aggressive. And that's a dominant trait that gets passed along to their offspring. Moving on to number seven, we have 
the infertile pink bullworm. The pink bullworms are invasive pests that lay eggs on cotton balls. And then once they hatch, the larvae eat the seeds and damage the cotton fibers. In 2005, the situation became so bad that scientists were like, okay, we gotta figure out a solution here. So they decided to create sterile pink bullworms. They did this by treating a bunch of moths with radiation. The radiation would damage their reproductive cells, but it wouldn't kill them. That way, when they encountered a normal pink bullworm and the two mated, bam, it would create an infertile pink bullworm. So for four years, two billion pink bullworm moths that were treated with radiation were released into Arizona's cotton fields. They literally would fly an airplane above the fields and just drop millions of these moths down onto the crops. And it worked. It helped with the bullworm problem. But imagine if their plan didn't work that could have gone really bad and damaged entire cotton fields. Coming in at number six, we have the sheep with human livers. In 2007, scientists at the University of Nevada, Reno, managed to grow human livers inside of a sheep. They did this by injecting human stem cells from bone marrow into sheep fetuses. Now they chose sheep as their test subjects because their circulatory system is very similar to ours. In the end, they managed to create livers made with 20% human cells. They are hopeful that one day this can be used to help grow human organs for those in need of a transplant inside these animals. But anything done with animals is highly controversial, especially when it has to do with injecting them with human DNA and stuff. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the cows. I swear, no animal is safe out there, okay? Not even cows. In 2008, British researchers were given the okay to conduct some human animal experiments. As part of the experiment, they decided to manipulate cow eggs. So they took the nucleus of the cow egg, which has the source of the most DNA, and they replaced it with the nucleus of a human cell to create a growing embryo. They then watched the egg develop and multiply. Scientists could then extract the stem cells from this. They hope that one day they can use the stem cells in disease treatments. Moving on to number four, we have the Jeep. And I'm not talking about the car Jeep, we're talking G-E-E-P, okay? A mixture between a goat and a sheep. Now these animals are adorably cute, but sadly breeding the two can be a very risky game. Very few babies are actually carried to term, and even few manage to survive birth. Those that do often have a bunch of genetic abnormalities, but people still cross them together, which is just sad because you're breeding animals destined for failure, and for what reason? Moving on at number three, we have the Jaglion. Can you guys guess what this animal is a mix between? It's kind of obvious. It's a mix between a jaguar and a lion. But these animals are actually naturally born, which is wild. Like, I just can't imagine a jaguar and a lion getting it on. So it first started when a lion and a jaguar coexisted in the same zoo together. They were raised together and well, one thing led to another, bada bing bada boom, mama lion became prego. I shared this love story in another video, but it's so cute, but also sad, but I just wanna share it again. So there once was a jaguar named Diablo and a lion named Lola. The two were raised side by side and they were inseparable. When Lola got mature though, they kept Diablo away from her so that they wouldn't mate. But whenever they were apart, both animals got depressed. It got so bad to the point where Lola wouldn't even eat. So they brought them back together and they were happy and eating and thriving again. You can't keep true love apart. And obviously one thing did lead to another and they did end up mating and they had two Jaglian babies together and they all lived happily ever after. Coming in at number two, we have the goat human. I can't with this one. Okay, I just can't. But this image right here is said to be a picture of a human goat baby. Story goes that in 2016 in Alabama, of all places, a goat gave birth to an odd looking baby. In fact, its kid looked very human-like. So it's said that this goat was actually the product of a human getting it on with a goat. I know, I know, it's disgusting, it's disgusting. I threw up in my mouth a little when I read that, but again, this is just a rumor. And 
And in our number one spot today, we have the hybrid lions. Now, this is actually a very sad example of crossbreeding gone wrong. In 2006, nearly two dozen crossbred lions in northern India were dying after they developed a mysterious disease. The disease was a result of inbreeding and a weakened gene pool. Basically, they didn't know this, but they kept breeding lions that all had this weakened gene, and nearly 80 lions were affected by this. The lions being born had weak hind legs and had difficulty walking, and they couldn't run at all. They also had failing immune systems and they weren't living too long. But the worst part was that they let these animals suffer. There's a wildlife law in India which prohibits the killing of animals. So basically, they had to just wait for these lions to die a slow, painful death on their own. It's a very tragic case of breeding gone wrong. Now, with the zebroids. When a zebra meets another equine species, such as a horse or a donkey, this happens. Depending on what the zebra gets intimate with, they can produce a zorse or even a zonkey. Just look at these things. They're like so strange looking, but on a genetic level, things get even stranger because the two species crossbred, such as a horse and a zebra, actually have a very different number of chromosomes that make up their genetic code. Now, normally this would be a major hurdle when it comes to two different species interbreeding, but when it comes to zebroids, they're just like, screw you, Mother Nature. On a side note, after hearing the word zonkey, I now know what I'm going to call my first child. Excellent. Trotting in at number nine now, we've got the Growler Bear. If you just cannot decide which is the coolest bear between a polar and a grizzly bear, well, meet the Growler Bear, which is a mix between the two. Although the polar bears are found in the Arctic and the grizzly bears in North America, their habitats do sometimes overlap, and when the bears meet, Growler Bears are born. One possible explanation for this is that global warming is melting the polar bears' icy homes and forcing them south into grizzly bear territory. But now we are on to number eight, which is the beefalo. And now I'm hungry. Unlike a lot of animals on this list, the beefalo is actually fertile, which means they can produce their own offspring. They themselves are the product of crossbreeding domestic cattle, the cows you see out in the field, and American bison. As you can see from the size and shape of these things, they were bred for their meat production. And it turned out their meat tends to be lower in fat and cholesterol than beef and less damaging to rangeland than cattle. I bet their milk is like steroids. Hmm. But on that note, we're going to talk about the wolf dog, which is our number seven. And I'm going to give you seven guesses which two animals make a wolf dog. I really hope nobody got this one wrong because it is, of course, a canine hybrid of a wolf and a dog. Now, usually the parent that's a dog will be a breed that resembles a wolf. So you're more likely to see a wolf being bred with a German Shepherd than you are with a poodle. That would just be weird. Wolf dog's appearances can vary wildly, and there is no real way of guessing what they'll look like until they're born. because the traits they inherit from either parent can be extremely random. Now, any pet that has wolf dog heritage at least four generations back can be considered a wolf dog. So you guys should check your family tree, and if you see a great grandmother that's a little bit too hairy, Maybe you're part wolf dog. But next up, we're gonna look at the Narluga because that is our number six. As you might have guessed from the name, these are the product of narwhals and belugas. Now, narwhals might look like a fictional cross between a unicorn and a seal, but they are real. And if they are bred with a beluga whale, they make a narluga. This occurrence is extremely rare though. And the only properly documented example of it happening in the wild was when scientists found one of them on the coast of West Greenland. They can be mainly identified by their massive heads, which has got me thinking that maybe I'm part Narluga. It explains a lot. Anyway, we are now halfway through our mashup of the animal kingdom, and we're at number five, which is the leopard. A leopard is the product of a male leopard and a lioness. The first documented case of this was one that was bred in India in 1910, but they have since been bred in zoos all around the world. Although the crossbreeding of these kind of cats are fascinating to the public, animal welfare groups have criticized the breeding of the leopards. Although they may look really cool, leopards often die as cubs, and if they do make it into adulthood, they have a very painful life with a number of different health problems. So just remember guys, just because something looks cool doesn't necessarily mean it is, like onyx. Onyx sucks. I've been waiting so long for a chance to fit that into a video, but now we're at number four, and we're looking at karmas. If you give a camel from Asia and a llama from South America some private time alone, you will come back months later to find a karma. Well, not quite. They were actually first produced using artificial insemination to create an animal that had the size and strength of a camel, but the more easygoing personality of a llama. Anyone that's ever seen a camel will know they're a bit grumpy. Well, sadly, it didn't go to plan. 
Japan. Karmas took after their camel parents and have proved to be very uncooperative with humans. I guess you could really say they've got the hump. Or not, whatever. Let's just move on to our number three now, which is savannah cats. Now, if you want something a bit more exotic than a normal house cat, then maybe the savannah cat is for you. This is what you get when you mix a wild African cat with an everyday domestic house cat. They gained popularity among breeders in the 1980s, but it wasn't registered as an official breed until 2001. Unlike domestic cats, they are very social creatures. They're also bigger than house cats and can reach 25 pounds in weight. And the best part is that savannah cats actually use litter boxes when they're domesticated. I might get one just to train my cat. Damn you, Sadie. Time flies when you're crossbreeding, and it's already time to announce our number two, which is Wolfins. Now, if this list was made purely on names alone, Wolfins would win it for me. But before you guys freak out and are like, wow, no way, this isn't real, whales are way too big. Well, you're technically right, but these whales are called false killer whales. They look a lot like killer whales, but they actually belong to the dolphin family. So when you breed them with a bottlenose dolphin, you get the wolfin, which is exactly half of either parent. Their bottlenose parent has 88 teeth, for example, and their false killer whale parent has 44. The wolfin child will sit right in the middle with 66 teeth. All right, time for a quick recap of all our weird and wonderful hybrids. We've looked at beefaloes, zebroids, and wolf dogs, but the one hybrid in the world that has captured the public's attention and got people interested in animal hybrids more than any other is our number one, and it's the Liger. A Liger is born when a male lion breeds with a female tiger. They are the largest living cats on the planet. Lions and tigers have growth inhibitors in their genes which help to control their size and stop them from growing too big. But when they produce a Liger together, these growth inhibitors don't seem to be active, which means Ligers can reach incredible sizes. Some female Ligers can grow to 10 feet in length and weigh more than 700 pounds. In our number 10 spot, we have the Enviro pigs. Scientists have recently created a new kind of pig. The pig that they created can absorb phosphorus in its body. Why is this important, you may ask? Well, scientists discovered that when pigs poo, I'm, I'm classy, really. <laughs> when pigs poo, they release a large amount of phosphorus into Mother Earth, and that makes her extremely unhappy. And so it became important for scientists to figure out a way to reduce this. Well, they did, and the genetically engineered pig they created absorbs most of the phosphorus in its body. I believe that this creation may be the first step in creating a pig army that could be used to take over the world, as pigs have a lot in common with humans. A pig army is definitely terrifying, and I really hope that's not the result of this. Let's move on. In our number 9 spot, we have the zombie dog. This one kind of makes me sick to talk about, but it has to be done. If you're a dog person, maybe cover your ears. In the 1940s, some Soviet scientists were apparently bored. Yep, bored, and decided to take the head off of a dog and put it on another animal's body. With some blood transfusion and oxygen pumped to the brain, their experiment was actually successful as the dog came back to life, and he even tried to lick his own nose. This experiment arguably poses a danger to the world's sanity, as dogs are the best creatures ever, and it's just horrible that this was done. But apparently, the science community has stated that this experiment did show some signs of hope in terms of finding solutions for people who are hemorrhaging blood too rapidly to be saved by conventional means. In our number 8 spot we have featherless chickens. This one is literally terrifying to look at, but also kind of terrifying if people are going to ingest this in the future. This is a new kind of chicken that scientists created that is featherless. It's fewer calories and higher protein. Sounds like every weightlifter's dream. <laughs> But don't get too excited about this because apparently these kinds of chickens are more prone to health conditions and are more likely to have parasites. Lovely. Well, this might be the meat that kills the world then. I hope if they do end up mass producing these kinds of chickens that they put on the label featherless chicken. Then people will have an option if they want to take the risk or not. I'm sure they'll do their best to correct this issue before giving it to humans to eat. But then again, actually I take that back, I don't have that much faith in our food suppliers. 
People get ill all the time from meat and they just do a mass recall and that's it. Anyways, buyer beware. In our number seven spot, we have the new sudden death mosquito. Honorable mention. Okay, so before you go hide under the covers, you know, something I wanna do like all the time, just know that the name of these mosquitoes, it's not as scary as it sounds. A mosquito was created to be essentially an anti-disease mosquito. As mosquitoes carrying malaria is a massive problem in African countries, scientists wanted to try to combat this issue and create a mosquito that would kill other mosquitoes, which eventually would extinguish the species in a few years. Of course, the major problem would be that it would completely disrupt the entire ecosystem that they are a part of. The mosquitoes help provide food for fish and birds and so many amphibians and insects and also in indirect ways for some animals. So it really just wouldn't be good if they were wiped out. Even though honestly, it would it would be nice to not be bitten alive every summer. They love my blood. In our number six spot, we have the spider silk goat. Okay, the idea of a spider goat existing is probably the most terrifying thing to imagine. And if such a thing did exist that had half spider features and half goat features, I would probably cry. However, in the case of this experiment, that isn't exactly what happened. A creature was created that looked like a goat and had so many regular qualities that would make it a goat. But the one difference is that it actually made spider silk protein in its milk and it could be spun to make spider silk. This is potentially really great for us as spider silk can produce such valuable things such as bandages that are superior and bulletproof armor. But yeah, if they ever create a goat with spider features, I think the world would be in extreme danger. At least our ability to stay sane would be at risk for sure. In our number five spot, we have the human pig. Ah, the human pig. Yeah, I bet some of you haven't heard of this one, and I mean, it doesn't exist anymore, but it did for 28 days before scientists shut down the experiment, so yeah. An experiment was done to create a human-animal hybrid by injecting human stem cells into a female pig. As I said, it was for 28 days, but that's one third of a pig's pregnancy, so the fetus was sufficiently developed before it all got shut down. They were not ready or prepared to deal with the unpredictable outcome if the human animal went to term, and they just kept it alive enough to understand how the cells interact with each other. Can you imagine a pig with a human brain alive and roaming free in this world? No, 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 I can't. <laughs> That would definitely be so dangerous, especially if it had pig instincts. Some pigs eat their babies. Enough said. In our number four spot, we have the glowfish. Glowfish are not necessarily a danger to us human beings, but most likely a danger to themselves. Let me explain. The glowfish are fish that have been created as a result of gene splicing, and yes, they glow in the dark. Pretty awesome. However, not so much for them. Why? Well, if they're released into the wild, then they will be extremely vulnerable as predators will be able to easily spot them because, well, they glow and they will be gobbled up easily. Even though there are already fish out there that naturally glow, so they already have to deal with this problem, what is the point of creating a new fish that will also be gobbled up? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> In our number three spot, we have Rupee. Rupee is a genetically engineered clone dog that is extremely cute. So cute. The world's first cloned beagle, to be exact. He's one of five beagles that were produced by a Korean scientist by the name of Byung Chung Lee. He was cloned by using a viral transfection of fibroblast cells with a protein that allows him to glow red in the dark. Yes, like the devil, because they are demon dogs. Okay, okay, fine. <laughs> this cloned species doesn't seem to threaten the world, but it will threaten all of those out there that get bothered by fluorescent light. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, this was just a scientifically created species that I wanted to give an honorable mention to because they are so cute. But seriously though, this is a big step forward for scientists working to cure human diseases as these dogs are the first modified genes cloned successfully. So really this creation could be the beginning of curing the world instead of endangering it. In our number two spot, we have fast-growing salmon. Scientists at Aqua Bounty created a genetically modified salmon that grows extremely fast. This new kind of salmon has the same odor, 
color, texture, and flavor of standard salmon, but it is able to grow twice as fast because of a growth hormone that stays activated throughout the entire year. But some believe that this could be dangerous to eat and as of yet we are unsure as to how safe it is. The FDA have not approved this kind of salmon just quite yet, so perhaps it's better to stay clear until the green light is given. Could be dangerous to the in our number one spot, we have the landmine detecting plant species. Yes, you heard me correctly. Scientists have genetically engineered a plant that can help us detect where landmines are in the world. You might not realize how big of a problem this is, but it is estimated that about 70 people die per day because of unknown landmines that were placed in different areas around the world during the previous wars. I actually know someone personally whose brother died because of a landmine explosion which is pretty insane. So the fact that a group of scientists have created a plant that could help detect them is so awesome. When it's near nitrogen dioxide, an ingredient known in explosives, the plant turns red. That will show us where the landmines are so that they can be removed more safely or even just avoided. The landmines are a danger to the world and this plant could actually be life-saving. So this spot might be the reverse of the title of this video, but this kick-ass new plant species needed an honorable mention. Number. 10. A Wolfen a wolfin is part whale, part dolphin. The existence of wolfins have been a legend for centuries. Known in fisherman lore as the great gray beast, they come from the mating of a female bottlenose dolphin with a male false killer whale. Now a false killer whale, by the way, is not actually a whale. Both these animals come from the oceanic dolphin family with the toothed whale suborder. Wolfins are one of the rarest hybrid animals. Citizen wolfin sightings in the wild are common Common, but concrete evidence still eludes scientists. Currently, we can only reliably see these animal hybrids in captivity. Wolfins are an extremely interesting balance of their parents as well. Their skin is a dark gray, the perfect blend of light gray dolphin skin and black false killer whale skin. They also have 66 teeth, which is the precise average of a dolphin's 88 teeth and the false killer whale's 44 teeth. To me, these look weird and they kind of make me uncomfortable. <laughs> Number 9. Wolf dog. A wolf dog, also called a wolf dog hybrid or wolf hybrid, is a candid hybrid resulting from the mating of a wolf and a dog. The term wolf dog is preferred by most of the animal's proponents and breeders because the domestic dog recently was taxonomically recategorized as a subspecies of wolf. The American Veterinary Medical Association and the United States Department of Agriculture refers to the animals as wolf dog hybrids. Rescue organizations consider any dog with wolf heritage within the last five generations to be a wolf dog, including some established wolf dog breeds. In 1998, USDA estimated an approximate population of 300,000 wolf dogs in the United States, the highest of any country worldwide, with some other sources giving a population possibly as high as 500,000. In the first generation of hybrids, gray wolves are most often crossed with wolf-like dogs such as German Shepherds, Siberian Huskies, and Alaskan Mammutes for an appearance most appealing to owners desiring to own an exotic pet. Because wolf dogs are generic mixtures between wolves and dogs, their physical and behavior characteristics cannot be predicted with any certainty. Number 8. Zebroid a hybrid between a zebra and any other member of the equine family is one of the most common in the animal kingdom. In most cases, the sire is a zebra stallion, the mother could be anyone. Known collectively as zebroid, the name of the breed depends on who the mother is. A fowl could be a zorse, zebral, zonkey, zibunky, or a zoni. Zebra hybrids usually have the appearance of whichever animal they have been crossbred with while still retaining the striped coat of a pure zebra. Now most of these animals don't have fully striped coats, instead the stripes are usually found on just the legs or non-white areas of the body, depending on the genetics of the non-zebra parent. When it comes to zonkeys, donkeys are closely related to zebras and both animals belong to the horse family. These zebra donkey hybrids are very rare. In South Africa, they occur where zebras and donkeys are found in proximity to each other. Today, various zebroids are bred as riding and draft animals and as curiosities in circuses and smaller zoos. Number 7. 
Growler bear. Known variously as a Pisley bear, a Growler bear is a grizzly and polar bear hybrid that is a rare hybrid within the Ursidae family. Tales of such creatures were told within the First Nation communities of North America down the centuries. But it wasn't until DNA samples were taken from a strange looking bear found near Sash Harbor in the Canadian Arctic in 2006 that their existence was finally confirmed. Growler bears are interesting because, generally speaking, polar bears and grizzlies have a mutual contempt for one another and will rarely coexist in captivity or in their natural habitats. However, extreme situations and human interventions have produced more of these adorably shaggy caramel colored hybrid bears. They typically grow to be slightly smaller than polar bears, averaging 60 inches tall at the shoulder and around a thousand pounds, but they're better to be able to survive in warm climates thanks to their grizzly bear genes. Number 6. Jag Lion A jag lion sometimes referred to as a jagion, is one of the many port mantises used to define hybrid species of animals. In this case, it is a blend of two cats, a lion and a jaguar. Both belong to the genus Panthera, their genetics aren't too far off. It's not surprising that they're able to mate, but they are extremely rare. A jag lion is the offspring of a female lion, lioness, and a male jaguar. To date, there haven't been any matings of a male lion and a female jaguar, so that hybrid doesn't have its own special name. Now, spots are definitely a dominant gene, and any speckled big cat is sure to pass them on to their offspring. And like its mother, the jag lion club has a distinct tuft of hair at the end of its tail. It wasn't until the 21st century that this crossbreed became known to the world. Before this century, there hadn't been any record of such a cross being made despite experiments in crossbreeding lions, leopards, and tigers. They are rare. And how rare is extremely rare? Well, right now there are only two jag lions in the world. They live in Canada and they were bred unintentionally and are in captivity. There has been no written record of any other crossbreeding between lions and jaguars. Number 5. The Iron Age Pig The Iron Age Pig is a hybrid between a wild boar and a domestic Tamworth pig meant to recreate the type of pig represented by prehistoric works of the Iron Age in ancient Europe. A project to create them, under the name Iron Age Pig, started in the early 1980s. In many areas, a variable of mixtures of these hybrids and feral pigs of all domesticated original stock have become invasive species. Their status as pest animals has reached crisis proportions in Australia, parts of Brazil, and parts of the United States, and the animals are often freely hunted in hopes of eradicating them or at least reducing them to a controllable population. When bred intentionally, the hybrids are intended to visually recreate the back breed look of pigs represented in the prehistoric artworks of the Iron Age and in early ancient Egypt. Now generally, they are only raised in Europe for a specialty meat market and in keeping with their heritage are generally more aggressive and harder to handle than pure domestic pigs. Number 4. Beefalo. Beefalo constitute a hybrid offspring of domestic cattle, usually a male, in managed breeding programs, and the American bison, usually a female, in managed breeding programs. Accidental crosses were noticed as long ago as 1749 in the southern states of North America during British colonization. Cattle and bison were first intentionally crossbred during the mid 19th century. In 1983, the three main beefalo registration groups reorganized under the American Beefalo World Registry. Until November 2008, there were two beefalo associations the American Beefalo World Registry and American Beefalo International. These organizations joined to form American Beefalo Association in Incorporated, which currently operates as the registering body for beefalo in the United States. Now, the breed was created to combine the characteristics of both animals for beef production. A recent USDA study showed beefalo meat, like bison meat, actually tended to be lower in fat and cholesterol. They are also thought to produce less damage to the rangeland than cattle. Personally, I just think saying beefalo is fun. You should try it. Number three. Green Sea Slug Possibly the most unusual hybrid animal on this list is the Green Sea Slug. It's a sea slug that incorporates genetic material from the algae it eats into its own DNA. So it's part sea slug, part algae. This strange result is a plant-animal hybrid that can consume food like an animal or create its own nutrients via photosynthesis. Scientists call these sea slugs emerald green algae. Their ability to turn solar energy into food is what gives them their brilliant 
green hue. Scientists acknowledge that they'll have to do more research in order to determine how this phenomenon happens, but as of now, this is their only successful instance of gene transfer from one type of complex organism to another. This creature can be found along the east coast of the United States, including the states of Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Rhode Island, Florida, and Texas. They can also be found as far north as Nova Scotia, Canada, and are most commonly found in salt marshes, tidal marshes, pools, and shallow creeks. Number two, hybrid crocodile. The only known hybrid crocodile in the world is named Yai. Yai's parents are a saltwater crocodile and a Siamese crocodile. The crossbreeding happened only because its parents were kept together in a zoo. It wouldn't have occurred in the wild as these two types of crocodiles have different habitats. Yai is huge. And in the year 2000, Guinness World Records said he was the world's largest crocodile had in captivity at 19 feet and 8 inches, which is as tall as a giraffe. He also weighed 2,645 pounds, which is almost the amount of two cows. Since then, Yai has grown even more and is now 21 feet long. He's located at the Samta Pukran Crocodile Farm and Zoo in Thailand. I hope I said that right. All I gotta say is I'm glad he's in captivity. I can't imagine how I would react if I saw him out in the wild. And coming in at number one, the super cow. The super cow, also known as a Belgian blue cow, is a breed of beef cattle from Belgium. The Belgium's blue's extremely lean, hyper sculpted, ultra muscular physique is termed double muscling. The double muscling phonotype is a heritable condition resulting in an increased number of muscle fibers instead of the normal enlarged of individual muscle fibers. This particular trait is shared with another breed of cattle known as Piedmontese. Both of these breeds have an increased ability to convert feed into lean muscle, which causes these particular breeds meat to have a reduced fat content and reduced tenderness. The Belgian blue is named after its typically blue-gray mottled hair, however its actual color can vary from white to black. The Belgian blue has been exported to many parts of the world. It is reported by Datis by 24 countries in Africa, the Americas, Europe, and Oceania. Of these, 10 report population data. In 2022, the world population was estimated to be around 107,875. Now, double-muscled cows routinely experience dystocia difficulty, impartuition, even when bred to normal beef bulls or dairy bulls because of a narrower birth canal. The birth weight and width of the calf also may be higher than in animals without the double-muscling gene. People also think it's unfair to breed these animals because of their difficulty walking due to the muscles and how big they are. These cows are absolutely jacked and I would not want to run into one of them or get in a fight with it. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot we have the centaur. This is one of the most famous hybrid creatures of all time, the infamous horseman of Greek legends. It isn't quite clear exactly how this legend originated but there is a really interesting theory which I love. Basically some people believe that perhaps the idea for this creature came about when the people of the Minoan culture who are said to have possibly at the time been unfamiliar with horses, they ran into a tribe of horse riders. The skill these people had in riding horses, along with how being able to traverse on horse would of course change the way that the Minoan people lived, basically just inspired them to create these tales of the horse-human hybrid creature. This seems like a very possible origin for the legend, but regardless of where it came from, the legend stuck around into Roman times, where it was then highly debated whether or not these creatures actually may exist. Clearly, however, this legend would go on to endure long past the days of ancient Rome, considering the fact that the tales of the centaur still exist today. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Echidna. The Echidna is a half-woman, half-snake creature that first became well-known through Greek mythology. In the legends, she is described as being a half-beautiful maiden and half-fearsome snake. In fact, Hesiod described her as an irresistible monster who is like neither mortal men nor the undying gods. Instead, she was, quote, half a nymph with glancing eyes and fair cheeks, and half again a huge snake, great and awful, with speckled skin. And she, quote, dies not nor grows.
grows old all her days. Echidna is the partner to Typhon, who is a terrifying snake man, and the two are said to have created the most horrendous children. The first child was Orthrus, who was a two-headed dog who guarded the cattle of Geryon. The second child was Cerberus, who was a dog with more than two heads who guarded the gates of Hades. And finally, their third child was the Lernian Hydra, a serpent with many heads who had the ability to regrow any if they were to get cut off. This is all to say that Echidna had quite a terrifying story to her, and it's interesting because some scholars believe that the tales of dragons in medieval Europe were actually based in part on Echidna. In our number 8 spot today we have the Mandrake. If you're a Harry Potter fan, you might be familiar with mandrakes, and they are particularly interesting because they are one of the few examples that represent a human hybrid that is a mix between human and plant. The mandrake plant is a very real group of plants in the genus Mandragora, and they are usually found in the Mediterranean. It is believed that the tales of the mandrake come from the fact that often the roots of the mandrake have such a strange appearance, they sort of look like human faces. This likely would have been enough to fuel the legend but things do not end here. The thing is, is that this plant has some hallucinogenic properties, so that, combined with the weird face looking roots, and you have the perfect recipe for quite a legend. It's funny to think that this story probably started out because someone was on a bit of a trip. In the legends, when the plant is dug up from the ground, it will release a horrible scream that has the ability to kill anyone who hears it. In our number 7 spot today we have the Sphinx. The Sphinx is of course commonly associated with ancient Egypt, and it is the creature that is depicted with the head of a human, the body of a large cat, and the wings of an eagle. Like I said, this image is often associated with ancient Egypt due to the famous monument that can be visited in Giza still today, but this isn't the only place the Sphinx is seen in legends. In Greek tradition, the Sphinx plays the role of a merciless woman who will kill and eat anyone who cannot answer her riddle as seen in the tragedy of Oedipus. When we take it over to Egypt, the Sphinx is often seen with the head of a man and was seen as a benevolent creature with incredible strength. The legends and imagery of the Sphinx have long endured the years since these ancient empires and continue today and have even expanded into different cultures. In our number 6 spot today we have sirens. These creatures originated from the tales of ancient Greece, and in these stories, sirens were creatures with the head and upper body of a human woman, but with the legs and tails of a bird. These creatures were alluring and exceptionally dangerous, mostly to sailors. The siren would sing a beautiful song from the rocky shores, which were said to hide dangerous reefs below the water. Using her songs, she would lure sailors to this treacherous area, likely to meet their demise. The siren is an important character in the legend of Odysseus as he returned from Troy in the epic. In the legend, he had to tie himself to the mast of his ship in order to resist the temptations and the lure. The tales of the siren have lasted for years and were still quite prevalent when they made a reappearance in the writings of 17th century Jesuit priests, who believed that these creatures were in fact real. Today we still use the word siren and the term siren song to describe things or ideas that are exceptionally intriguing and alluring. Throughout Throughout the years, the descriptions of the siren have gone on to become a bit more mermaid-like than bird-like as they originated, which does bring me to my next point. In our number 5 spot today we have mermaids. Mermaids are one of the most famous creatures in our modern mythology that came all the way from ancient Assyria. These creatures with the upper body of a human and the lower body of a fish, all from the goddess Atargatis who transformed herself into a mermaid after she was ashamed of herself for accidentally killing her partner. Partner. A tragic story that spurred the tales of mermaids for centuries to come. Since these legends, mermaids have appeared in stories all over the world and often people regard them as less than fictional. Christopher Columbus swore he saw real mermaids on his voyage to the New World, but then again it's becoming abundantly clear that he had no idea what he was looking at for a lot of that journey. Some places and cultures have slightly varying versions of the mermaid, like the Selkie, which is an Irish and Scottish version of a mermaid who is half seal and half woman. Of course, this creature went on to inspire many famous stories, including the Disney smash hit, The Little Mermaid. In our number 4 spot today we have a harpy. Harpies are a character seen in Greek and Roman stories, and in those they are described as a bird, but with the head of a woman. And at first I thought that sounds kind of nice and cute, but when we take it back to some of 
the earliest mentions of harpy, like by the poet Ovid, we see them described as human vultures, which sounds significantly more terrifying than what I was imagining. In fact, harpies are quite often described as horrifying, disgusting creatures, with descriptions that only get more grim as time goes on. Initially, it seems as though harpies were seen as the personification of storm winds, and throughout the legends we see that they would often steal food from their victims as they were trying to eat, and also, they would be responsible for carrying those who had done evil things to the Arenes, who were the female deities of vengeance. When a person suddenly disappeared off the earth, it is thought to have been the work of the harpies. They were the agents of punishment who were known to be cruel, vicious, and pretty violent as well. In our number 3 spot today we have the Gorgons. It is possible that you may not be familiar with the term Gorgon, but it is very likely that you know one of them. The descriptions of the Gorgons do vary slightly, but they commonly refer to three sisters, Stheno, Uriel, and Medusa. These sisters were mostly human, except for the fact that their hair was made up of slithering, slimy snakes. The earliest examples of the Gorgons comes from the Greek mythology, in which the Gorgon-like creature had scales and claws laws, but no serpent hair. When the tales of the three sisters came into play, so did the stories of how they had horrifying faces that should anyone gaze upon them, they would immediately be turned into stone. In the legends, two of the sisters are immortal, but the most famous of the trio, Medusa, was not. This led to her being slain by the demigod Perseus, but not so much could be said for the other two. In our number two spot today, we have the Minotaur. This creature was first seen in Greek legends and later Roman, and basically it is a creature that is part bull, part man. The name of this creature comes from the bull god Minos, who was a major deity in ancient times. The Minotaur is said to have been created as Minos competed with his brothers as ruler. During this time, Minos prayed to Poseidon, the sea god, to send him a snow white bull as a sign of the god's favor. Minos was meant to sacrifice the bull in order to honor Poseidon, but he was entranced by the bull's beauty and decided to keep him, thinking that the god would accept a different sacrifice in place of the bull. Of course, Poseidon was not pumped about this decision, so he needed to punish Minos. He did this by making Minos's wife fall in love with the bull, and one thing led to another, and there was some very unnatural offspring. In the end, the Minotaur was born, but there was no natural food source for this creature, so instead it began to devour human flesh to appease its appetite. The creature is depicted as having the head and tail of a bull with the body of a man. While the most famous appearance of the Minotaur was in the Greek story of Theseus, who actually fought the Minotaur in the labyrinth, the legend of this creature has long prevailed and is seen in many stories still today, including Dungeons and Dragons. And some would even argue that the beast in Beauty and the Beast is a creature modeled after the Minotaur. In our number one spot today, we have the satyr. We're not just talking about Mr. Tumnus, we are taking it all the way back to the Greek stories of the creature who is half man and half goat. The these creatures started out in legends as a male nature spirit with ears and a tail resembling those of a horse, but throughout the years they became more human-like and less beast-like before they began to gain these more goat-like characteristics. It is thought that perhaps the depiction of the goat-human hybrid comes from them sort of melding with the character Pan. Either way, these creatures are often depicted as being comically hideous, and they also have quite a few lewd descriptions that I can't exactly detail here on YouTube. Let's just say it is very obvious that they're always a little excited. This fits perfectly with the fact that these creatures are often known to love things like wine, music, dancing, and definitely women. Satyrs were companions to the god Dionysus and are believed to live in places like woodlands or the mountains or even in pastures. They are very motivated by sexual desires and are even known to do some pretty horrendous things in pursuit of these desires. Although these characters are quite ridiculous in a multitude of ways, they are also thought to possess a lot of really useful knowledge but they need to be persuaded into sharing it. How human. That's the most human-like characteristic that these guys have. Starting off this countdown, we have the rat pigs. The Salk Institute for Biological Studies in the US has been known to run a number of crossbreeding experiments. One was performed on rats and pigs. The team of scientists decided to take stem cells from rats and inject them into pig blastocysts. However, this failed. And I mean, I'm not surprised. Rats and pigs have different gestation times, and genetically, they are very different. But imagine a pig that looked like a rat. Okay, that is terrifying. 
In our ninth spot, we had the human Z attempts. In 1967, scientists in China were working on creating a human chimp mix. Sadly, not much information about these experiments have been disclosed to the public. But rumor has it that the experiments didn't really work. They wanted to basically create a chimp that could talk fluently in whatever language it was taught. Then in 1981, they tried this experiment again. They impregnated a female chimpanzee with human sperm. Turns out, the chimp did manage to get pregnant by it, but sadly passed away three months later due to complications. Coming in at number 8, we have the rat mouse. Scientists at the Salk Institute have found a way to grow the pancreatic tissue of a mouse inside of a rat. The mouse pancreas was able to grow inside of rats successfully. So they grew these new pancreases from mouse stem cells that were then placed in the bodies of the rats. And then when the pancreases were complete, they transplanted them back into the mice. Now the biggest thing about this experiment is that this technique could reverse diabetes in the mice. So they hope that one day they can grow organs inside the bodies of different animals and then you transplant those organs into humans to cure diabetes. Of course, there's still so much work to be done on this. The last thing they want is to grow a human organ inside of an animal and then have the recipient's body reject it. In our seventh spot, we have the killer bees. Did you know that killer bees were accidentally created by scientists? If they're out here creating bees that threaten the ecosystem, then who's to say they won't create animals that do the same? Basically, this all started in the 1950s. A biologist was commissioned by the Brazilian government to create a species of bees that would increase honey production. But along the way, things went wrong. The biologist himself didn't have much experience with animal breeding. In the end, bees from southern Africa and local Brazilian honeybees mated and it produced these angry killer bees. And then of course, thousands of these bees just accidentally escaped. Now they get their name because when pissed off, they have been known to chase people down for more than a quarter mile. And on top of that, their stings are very painful. These bees are also aggressive towards other bees as well. So it puts them at risk and now we're kind of just stuck with them. In our six spots, Today we have the human mouse. In the late 90s, three doctors started doing experiments to try and create human body parts in a lab. One of these experiments involves growing a human ear on the back of a mouse. So they did this by creating an ear shaped scaffolding and putting cells of cartilage from a cow on it. They then put the mouse under anesthetic and placed this ear under its skin. Crazily enough, the mouse's body fed the cow cartilage cells. The scaffolding dissolved and the mouse grew this artificial shape of a human ear, but it was only the outside of an ear. Okay, It didn't work, there was no eardrum. Now you might be wondering why they did this. Well, their hope is that this will help plastic surgeons when reconstructing human ears for their patients. So they would create this ear on the mouse and then graft it onto the person. So you'd have an ear that is part mouse, part cow. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the goat with human milk. I swear I didn't make this up, it's real and I'm a little disturbed. But basically, scientists have figured a way for goats to produce human breast milk. They did this by transferring human breast milk enzymes and proteins into goat embryos. In the end, they found that the milk the goats were producing wasn't 100% human, but it contained 60% of the lysosome and lactoferrin found in human milk. Now, why do they want goats producing human breast milk? Well, it could feed and save babies in need. Plus, it would have a longer shelf life. Would you try this milk? Let me know in the comments below. I've heard breast milk is pretty sweet, but I don't think I want to try it. Coming in at number four, we have the Belgian super cow. Now, you guys know how much I love cows. And if you didn't know, then hi, my name is Lindsay and I love cows. But this thing is terrifying. It's monstrous, okay? It's super ripped and it's just massive. The Belgian super cows were created back in the 1800s when Belgian scientists and farmers mixed native cattle with shorthorn cattle. Then over the time, they would select the biggest and strongest offsprings of each variety and then breed them together. So on and so on, bam! 
you got a super cow, which is definitely the biggest and strongest, and I understand why they call it the super cow. Like, just look at this beast, okay? It could crush anyone. In our third spot, we have the Enviro Pig. So pig waste is actually pretty toxic. I mean, if you've seen the Simpsons movie, then you'd know all about it. I mean, that was a bit of an exaggeration, but still. Anyways, pig's waste contains really high levels of phosphorus. This phosphorus ends up in lakes and rivers and oceans and can cause a boom of algae. So scientists were trying to come up with a way for pigs to have less toxic waste, hence the creation of the Enviro Pig. Enviro Pigs are pigs with up to 65% less phosphorus in their excretements. This pig was first created in 1999 at the University of Guelph's farm in Canada. This pig had its phytase gene attached to a piece of mouse DNA. Now it's really complicated to explain, but here's an explanation, and I quote, the genetically altered pig was created using genetic material from a mouse and an E. coli bacterium to reduce phosphorus in the pig's feces. In the end, it made the pig excrete fewer pollutants. Moving on to number two, we have the pig with human blood. Now you're probably noticing a trend by now. Pigs and mice are the scientists' test subjects of choice. Researchers at Mayo Clinic in Minnesota have managed to create pigs made out of human blood. So the pigs have human blood pumping through their veins. Not only that, but some of the cells in the blood merge together to create pig-human cell hybrids. Now, the reason behind this all is to allow scientists to study how viral infections can transfer from animals to humans. And in our number one spot today, we have Oliver the Chimp. In the 1970s, there was a performing chimpanzee that received a lot of attention. His name was Oliver. Now, Oliver was really different from other chimps for a number of reasons. The main being that Oliver might have been a successful mix between a human and a chimp. Yeah, you heard me. A lot of doctors and scientists are convinced that Oliver was a human Z. It's believed that they inseminated a female chimp with male sperm and Oliver was the offspring. Now let's take a look at the facts. Oliver didn't look like other chimps. In fact, he had a more human-like appearance. He had a flatter face than other chimpanzees and he walked on two feet instead of all fours. He also preferred human females over female chimpanzees, and he understood humans very well. So could it be that Oliver was actually half human, half chimp? Starting off our list at number 10, new bees. Great, sick of the old ones that sting you in the neck and then you're allergic? We got some new bees now to worry about, here we go. A lot of us know bees are pretty harmless and kind of cute, hairy little pollinators. Unless of course, like I mentioned, you're allergic or terrified of them. But truthfully, bees normally do a lot more good than harm, obviously, right? Save the bees. That was of course until an experiment in the 70s went south. Yeah, this experiment resulted in a new bee, just a dangerous bee. The idea was to take a regular honey bee and breed it with a bee that is found in Africa that produces more honey. And of course the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also be able to provide more honey than a regular honey bee. Good stuff, right? On paper, this sounds like a step in the right direction. Well, the bees that came out were a lot less manageable and they didn't even make more honey. Yeah, liars. You're fired, all 1,000 of you. Get out of here. After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment, and in the 80s, we saw the beginning of a massive trouble. These bees are not only aggressive towards other kind of bees, which creates a huge problem, but they're also very aggressive towards human beings. Nice. And when these guys sting, their stinger stays with them, so they can, you know, continue to Julius Caesar you how many times they want. The victims of these swarms receive 10 times the amount of stings as regular swarms, so... Horrible, horrible news. And they react to disturbances 10 times faster and they will also chase said disturbance a quarter of a mile. So, hope you can run really fast and really far. Number nine. Wolfen. These guys were created when a female common bottlenose dolphin was bred with a male false killer whale. Yeah, we shouldn't be doing this. They're extremely rare and they have been found in the wild, but unfortunately, most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity, because humans are the worst. The first recorded wolfin was born in the Tokyo Sea World in 1981, and he very sadly died just 200 days later. Didn't even make it one year, horrible. Probably a prime example of why they maybe shouldn't exist in the first place. I don't know, just a wild observation. The first that was born in the United States that actually somehow survived was at Sea Life Park in Hawaii in May 1985, and her name was Kekamalu. She ended up having three babies. The first passed away after a few days, the second passed away at the age of nine, but thankfully the third one is still alive. In March last year, both Kekamalu and her daughter were still alive, but they remain, of course, in captivity. So it's like, great. 
but not, really not at the same time. Number eight, farm cattle. Back in the 90s, farmers in India were told that if they crossbred their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which in turn would mean more money for them and their families. Awesome, this should be amazing and great news, right? Well, considering why we're here watching, I don't think it's, uh, it's gonna end the way we think, no. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting great results, but they ended up being stuck with cattle that did produce more milk, great, but they also needed way more food. They needed high quality food as well, or else they'd stop producing more milk and they were less resistant to the local diseases, so they required more veterinary visits. So it cost them more money, you know what I mean? Yeah, we got more milk, but we have to spend more money on maintaining the damn thing. It's not a win, it's not a win in my book. Number seven, old Buffalo Jones. Here we go, a guy named Charles Buffalo Jones. Let's talk about him. This man started breeding animals in 1906 because the bison population in Arizona at the time was exceptionally low. So bison were bred with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. Nice, old Buffalo Jones getting his science on. He ended up just giving up on this and released the animals who were then managed by the state, and the numbers remained relatively low because of limited hunting licenses. Well, when the beefalo, good name, found their way into a national park where hunting is banned and therefore aren't any you know, natural predators, the population began to grow by 50% a year. That's a lot of beefalo. So none of this is necessarily bad, but it's the animal's environmental impact that has the real trouble. First off, they're very thirsty animals and they can consume 10 gallons each per trip to a watering hole. So they're sucking it all up, you know what I mean? It's like when you're in school and you're waiting for water and the guy in front of you just keeps drinking. You're like, oh my God, what are you doing? Where is this going? Not to mention the fact that they do their dirty business in the water and that basically just ruins it all. Basically, they've thrown the entire ecosystem off balance and have pushed out other animals and insects and plant life around have also been infected, all because they're thirsty and they like to take big shits where we all drink our water. Thanks, Beefalo. Number six, hybrid lion. Back in the 1980s, the Chatbir Zoo in Chandigarh, India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller, has a less shaggy mane. They would breed that with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. Again, sounds like a great plan at first. How do we make it happen without making weird animals? The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and then brought them in to breed with their other two Asiatic lions. Nice. Hey, we'll save ya. Just kidding, even worse. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was already a mistake as the cubs all had severely weak back legs. They were all shaky. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older, their immune system started to fail more and more. Sadly, by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions and they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any reproduction further. There's also laws that prohibited them from killing animals, so they were simply just waiting around for them to die naturally. It's kind of a weird circle we got. Into. When there's a dwindling population of lions, it's insane to me that they just wasted 20 years trying to do this when they could have just simply bred the lions that they had. You know what I mean? It was right there and they're like, all right, now let's try something new. It's like, what? No, why? Number five, Kunga. Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing, here we go, halfway through, time to turn it up a bit. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that roamed ancient Mesopotamia. Now this was a time before even horses arrived, so they had to do something, right? Large kungas would pull wagons and smaller ones would help pulling plows. These little guys, they were the talk of the town. Imagine hybrid animals before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Yeah, yeah, yummy, I wonder what this one is. Smells a little stinky. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. And yeah, it's a wild ass over there. Hey, nice wild ass. It's wild what you can still learn from ancient animal bones from even thousands of years ago. It's mind blowing. More amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. Do we bring back the kunga? I don't know. Number four, super cow. Moo, but with a lot of O's. Just tons of a moo, just a mighty moo. Introducing the super cow. All right, start your day off with some super milk and then have a super stomach ache and shit your super pants. Only in Belgium, let's do it. Back in the 1800s, scientists and farmer brought together native cattle and short horn cattle. After that, they would literally pick the biggest of the bunch and then have them breed together. These cows are officially called Belgian blues but I will continue to call them super cows. Thank you very much. I can't even look at these guys. They're disturbing. They look like bodybuilders. That makes no sense. They have like eight biceps, the incredible Hulk, just with more milk. Number three, 
The mouse with an ear on its back. Oh, I want to Q-tip this guy every time I see him. The mouse with a human ear, folks. How did this happen? This is like the world's greatest mouse spy. Stuart Little's evil brother. Let's do it. Back in 1997, this Vacanti mouse became the test subject to determine if scientists could grow cartilage using chondrocytes, aka cells from a cow. And clearly it worked a little too well. It's a little odd what we have. We're still talking about it, obviously. It's weird. It all started when Joseph Vicanti, a pediatric surgeon, began designing human organs. This was during a shortage in time. He wasn't just bored and started to make ears. He was changing the medical game. And little did he know, he was about to change the science game as well. He constructed an ear and he told his brother Chuck and his partner Bob to not bring up the fact that he attached said ear to a live mouse. Kind of hard to bring up, but we'll do our best. Okay. Chuck failed. He spilled the beans almost right away. But now we know that cow cartilage can create human cells. That's great. I want a Q-tip his back. Is that weird? That's not weird. It gives ear cheese a whole new meaning. We're gonna throw out. Number two, the Zorse. I'll give you a second to figure out what animal this is. Nice, there you go. Male zebra, female horse. Now we've got a really fun word. Zebroids are also quite common historically. Charles Darwin even noted some in his work. So since the 19th century, crossbreeding zebras with horses and donkeys, it's all been done. More often than not, and this is what makes them stand out, zebroids will experience dwarfism. It's pretty cute. In 2010, a zedonk was born, a zebra donkey. All these fun names, right? But again, back in the 70s, three were born in Colchester Zoo. These zookeepers were like, hmm, how do we make zoos new and hip and bizarre? Are. Oh, I know. Humans are not great. Humans are too bored, it seems. And finally, number one, Hiramitsu Nakauchi, stem cell biologist from Tokyo. This last one is too wild. Just recently, his experiments have been approved by the government, so things are actively in play here. Not old Farmer Joe in the early 1900s. No, we're getting to modern science now. Hiramitsu hopes to grow human cells inside mice and rats, right? Like we just talked about. But then he wants to transplant those embryos into surrogate animals. A lot of animals, a lot of cells, a lot of traffic going in and out. Cells into rats and mice embryos, how do we even get here? We went from Salem witch trials to rodents being genetically manipulated so they can make pancreases for you. What? But his hope here was that the rodents' bodies will be used for human cells to then make a pancreas for themselves. So it's kind of like a kickoff into biology, right? Here's the thing, while conducting said experiments, they found out that rats were starting to develop a human-type brain. Yeah, that's when they decided to pull the plug, rightfully so. The second humans and animals get too close, governments come in and they go, hey, stop, thanks. Mm -hmm.